Hello, this is Moses A. Mawa, President and CEO of Silver Trust Media, Afro Global Television, and the Transformation Institute for Leadership and Innovation. Together for Change is an anti-black racism campaign. We are delighted to kick it off today with Mayor John Tory of the great city of Toronto, along with a panel of distinguished experts and community leaders. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We must read Canada, and indeed the entire world, of discrimination, which is pervasive, especially against people of African descent and indigenous people. On Canada Day, which was July 1st, 2020, we presented the Afro TV initiative to Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, the Parliament of Canada, and CRTC. The goal of the initiative is to ensure that we get a broadcasting license that, you, that is actually a lot more accessible than the present Afro Global Television channel. It will be very much like APTN, that's the Aboriginal People's Television Network. We have held conference calls with top officials at the Department of Canadian Heritage, the CRTC, and other departments. Please support this all-important initiative because it will help to amplify black voices and help transform the destiny of people of African descent. Together we can build a better nation and a better world. Now here is a special video on the United Nations Decade for People of African Descent and it is something that was produced by Silver Trust, Afro Global and other partners. It gives context about the past, the present and the future. United Nations International Decade for People of African Descent was proclaimed by the UN General Assembly to be observed from 2015 to 2024. It provides a framework for the member states, civil society, and others to take effective actions in the spirit of recognition, justice, and development. Today, 200 million people of African descent live in North, Central, and South America as well as the Caribbean. Millions more live in other parts of the world. The population of Africa itself is now 1.2 billion. The purpose of the decade is to strengthen actions and measures to ensure full realization of the economic, social, cultural, and political rights, as well as the potential of African people. As a UN ambassador of goodwill for the international decade of people, African descent, I implore policy leaders, policy makers, and fellow global citizens from all backgrounds to do the right thing and act, not just talk, debate, and issue formal declarations. During the 15th century, the transatlantic slave trade violently displaced over 12 million African people. Between the 1870s and 1900s, Africa faced European imperialist aggression, diplomatic pressures, military invasions, and eventual colonization. The continent's immense natural wealth and human resources continued to be plundered in subsequent centuries. According to the United Nations, people of African descent constitute some of the most marginalized groups in the world. They also tend to suffer multiple aggravated or intersecting forms of discrimination. People of African descent have made enormous contributions to society. This includes inventions like the elevator, traffic light, laser eye surgery, open heart surgery, industrial lubricant, the wrench, street sweeper, fountain pen, pencil sharpener, and others. Many have demonstrated mastery in business media, sports, justice, collective vision, leadership, and more. 
While people of African descent make up 3% of the population, they account for 10% of the Canadian prison population. There are 70% more black Canadians in federal prison than there were 10 years ago. School dropout, lack of access to opportunities, anti-black racism, and many other problems severely limit success. Local, provincial, and the federal government need to make a commitment to eradicating the roadblocks that truncate their progress. Racism persists, yes, even in this country. That inequality lingers still despite the work done, and that is why we need trailblazers to team up with entertainers and young entrepreneurs to help others become agents of change because there is still much work to do. According to data from Statistics Canada, African Canadians are the third largest visible minority group with a population of about 1.2 million. Meanwhile, the second largest group of immigrants coming to Canada is from Africa. This calls for strategic action. Organizations like the Mikhail Jean Foundation, Federation of Black Canadians and others are all building solidarity in the community and with all people of goodwill to accelerate positive change. Future generations of African Canadians will continue to stand on the shoulders of trailblazers such as civil rights icon Viola Desmond, first African Canadian Governor General Mikhail Jean, Lieutenant Governors Lincoln Alexander of Ontario and May Ann Francis of Nova Scotia, entrepreneur and philanthropist Michael Lee Chin, sports legend Harry Jerome, jazz pianist Oscar Peterson, the Honorable Dr. Jean Augustine, first black female member of parliament and champion for the recognition of Black History Month across Canada. We have a moral imperative to stand, demand and show what respect means beyond colorful words and formal declarations. Mass incarceration, lack of access to education, to employment, to health care, and to political decision making categorize the fundamental injustices all too characteristic of the treatment of peoples of African descent in America and throughout the world. The United Nations International Decade for People of African Descent is a time for the world to reclaim its lost humanity, to right the wrongs of history, and chart a path of harmony and unhindered prosperity that will impact present and future generations. Hi, my name is Michael Forrest, founder and chairman of the Canadian Black Chamber of Commerce and the National African Canadian Association. On behalf of our members across Canada, we are very proud to be partnering with Africa Television in bringing you Together for Change campaign. Economic development is very important to Canada and the black community, and that is why we are partnering with all levels of government, corporate Canada, and the many black businesses across Canada. So we welcome you to join us in the Together for Change campaign. Now let's meet the moderators of today's event. Patricia Bibi Amawa has served as president of Planet Africa Group, the executive vice president of Afro Global Television and Silver Trust Media, the largest black owned media organization in Canada. She is also the host of the Planet Africa show on Omni TV. She has directed and produced over 15 television programs, including The Golden Button and Standing Ovation. Patricia is the associate publisher of Excellence, Envision, and Destiny magazines. In 2008, Silver Trust Media introduced the Discover magazine series, which has since released over 20 titles and editions in various countries. Listed in the Who's Who in Black Canada, she is a recipient of the York Regional Police Civic Leadership Award, the Martin Luther King Dreamkeeper Award, and a Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Medal. The mother of four is the co-founder of the Crossover Mentorship Program, a youth empowerment initiative. Patricia was spotlighted as Woman of the Week in Women's Post and also featured on CNN International in a half-hour special with her husband Moses. 
In March 2016, the duo launched Afro Global Television, a 24-hour television channel that is on Rogers Cable, Bell 5, East Link, and TELUS across Canada. In 2018, Patricia and Moses co-authored the 150 Extraordinary Canadians Legacy Book with a foreword by the Right Honourable Justin Trudeau. Andrea Barrett is the President of the Canadian Black Chamber of Commerce, an organization committed to building economic bridges by promoting and empowering black entrepreneurs and the black businesses community. Andrea is also the CEO of the Diversity Agency and represents speakers and diversity and inclusion facilitators specializing in systemic bias and anti-racism training. Under her leadership, the Canadian Black Chamber of Commerce has established partnerships with organizations including Shia Moisture, Shopify, and Uber. Andrea was responsible for launching the hashtag Save Black Businesses campaign and is frequently seen and heard in local media. In addition, Andrea represents the Canadian Black Chamber of Commerce on the Pan-African Credit Union Steering Committee. Andrea Barrett and the Canadian Black Chamber of Commerce are committed to the success of black entrepreneurs in Canada. Hello and welcome. On behalf of Silver Trust Media, Afro Global Television, the Canadian Black Chamber of Commerce, and the Transformation Institute for Leadership and Innovation, I'd like to welcome you to this town hall event on the topic, Systemic Racism and a Way Forward. This is the first of a series of programs that we're going to be having in the Together for Change campaign. And I'm glad you could join us. So uh, look out for more programs like this in the coming weeks. We are being joined by Mayor John Tory and the Deputy Mayor Michael Thompson. And later on in the program, we'll be joined by Professor Afua Cooper of Dalhousie University and Keith Merritt, two-time president of the Association of Black Law Enforcers. He's a strong ally and someone that I, I would love to say is an authentic human being. A few years ago, when we wanted to launch Afro Global Television, we reached out to him to be in the advisory board, and he said yes. And he also wrote a letter of support, which actually was instrumental in Afro Global getting courage on cable. So it's really a pleasure to have him join us uh, on today's program, as well as the deputy mayor of the city of Toronto, our very own uh, Michael Thompson. Now to the first question. So Ontario Premier Doug Ford recently stated that Canada doesn't have the same systemic deep roots of racism that the United States does. He has since retracted that statement, but RCMP Commissioner Brenda Lucky also failed to acknowledge that there was systemic racism in the RCMP and backpedaled after public backlash. Mayor John Tory, you have acknowledged that anti-Black racism exists in Toronto and exists in the country. Why is it important to acknowledge the fact that anti-Black racism and systemic racism exists? Because if you don't acknowledge it and you try and pretend it doesn't exist, then you're never going to be able to come to grips with it. If there was a galvanizing moment for me, there have been many. Uh, it was when we went out and did the consultations for the anti-Black racism action plan that we put in place. It was something that I uh, conceived of with great help from Deputy Mayor Michael Thompson. Uh, and we listened to 800 people. And when you heard people talk about, you know, being followed around a store, when you heard the story of our police chief, who happens at this moment in time to be a black man, say when he walks into a store in his plain clothes and within 30 seconds, somebody's following him around the store, the last guy that's likely to, you know, be doing anything, no matter what the color of his skin. When you hear about uh, the facts and figures, when you hear from our black staff network at the city hall, of uh, some of the obstacles they believe have been in their way uh, in getting uh, ahead at city hall, uh, notwithstanding that we have a Black Staff Network and we have an anti-Black racism program and so on. And when you hear um, people in that staff network say that ordinary things the rest of us would take for granted, like walking in the park, walking down the street, that those are objects of fear 
uh, for people who have black skin and on I could go. That's when you know that if you don't acknowledge it exists because it does on a systemic basis, kind of baked into the system, you'll never be able to confront it. I mean, if you said, well, where do we have to attack this? The answer is everywhere. I mean, there's been a great focus recently on policing and, and uh, Deputy Mayor Thompson and myself uh, passed a motion together with, I think uh, it was a vote of 22 to two at the city council to bring about a significant number of reforms uh, in policing, uh, in every aspect of policing just about, and that now process is underway. But you look at education. I mean, the fact is you still do have the highest dropout rate. And I have met the kids in the schools in Toronto who are African Canadian kids. And they have no less ambition, no less ability, uh, you know, no less desire to be whatever they want to be. And they'll name you the same professions as every other kid. But there are obstacles that stand in their way that we have to sweep away through extra support and through different things that take account of that. Business. I mean, I said a week or 10 days ago, I wrote a letter, an open letter to all the business community in Toronto and said, every single business in Toronto of any substance at all, in fact, even the small ones, should have an anti-Black racism eradication plan. And it simply includes the kind of training that I took together with members of my staff about three weeks ago. And it opened my eyes, even as someone who you know, likes to think that I've been trying to educate myself by going around to these different community meetings and so on that I was talking about earlier. And when I heard, we went through an exercise, I won't go through, through the detail, that sort of said, look, we as other people who are not black tend to identify black people in Toronto solely on the basis of the color of their skin, as opposed to any other personality attribute, educational achievement, career achievement. Um, that, that's the first thing we'd say when you say, what about that person? They say, well, that person's black. Then that isn't meant to be a bad thing. It's just that anybody that has that narrow a construct put on sort of who they are, is going to be somebody that automatically is at a disadvantage relative to others. And so we have to deal with that. And, and the, it, it goes through, it goes through business, it goes through the legal system, it goes through the political system where the black community in Toronto is dramatically underrepresented. Michael Thompson is the only black member in a city that I think has something like 8% of its population is black. There's one member of city council who is. And so these are all things we have to tackle one at a time, and I'm very determined to do it. But you have to do it in a way that engenders and maintains the confidence of the public, uh, so that the rest of the public, including the black communities, uh, so that you can actually get it done. Because if it gets mired in endless, uh, you know, uh, adversarial, uh, confrontational, polarized debate, then less will get done, and we will make less prog progress in eradicating anti-black racism. We saw in the video earlier on that even though people of African descent make up just 3% of the Canadian population, uh, they account for about 10% of the Canadian prison population. And also that in the last 10 years, you know, there's been a hike, 70% hike in the number of people of African descent in the prisons, the federal prisons. Now, um, Mayor, you did mention a few things that you're already doing um, as a Toronto City Council to alleviate you know, some of the problems that people of African heritage are facing in Canada. But my question is, um, there is economic disparity, lack of opportunity, and anti-black racism that the community has to deal with. What do you think can be done at the federal, provincial, and municipal level to change the outcomes? In terms of addressing the issue around economic opportunity and economic development, this is an area that I'm responsible for at the city. We have actually been working on addressing the issue around procurement, for example, opportunities for uh, black and indigenous uh, businesses to be able to do more business with the city. Um, in fact, just uh, last week, we launched an economic recovery advisory group that has um, uh, a number of members of the black community on that group uh, to help to advise the city with respect to a direction and focus terms of creating more economic opportunities and so on. Uh, there are opportunities that are being created at the city where we're, we've hired more people of, of uh, more blacks uh, in the city of Toronto, more are moving into uh, senior responsibility at the city and that's really important. Um, as you've heard from the mayor, the mayor has uh, addressed the business community with respect to focusing its attention on uh, engaging in hiring more blacks uh, to ensure that there are opportunities for them from an economic development perspective and so on. And so there is um, not simply just conversations that are actually taking place. There are constructive 
um, elements that are being uh, woven into the, uh, the framework of the system to incur encourage more people to participate and to benefit from the economic uh, opportunities and so on. No, there's been discussions with the banking community, for example, some of the challenges that black businesses face with respect to being able to get loans. Some of the other works that we're actually doing from the economic development perspective, we're focusing on um, you know, areas like digital Main Street, focusing on technology, how technology can actually help uh, businesses, uh, black businesses and other businesses as well on our Main Street. Um, we're working with respect to the BBPA, for example, with uh, the businesses on Eglinton Avenue West, Little Jamaica. Uh, we at the City of Toronto are actually investing uh, in, um, in initiatives to help those businesses. So there's a real direct effort in order to uh, address some of these fundamental problems and so on. Mayor, I don't know if you want to uh, add anything further to that. I will simply say this. On the justice system itself, uh, we have found uh, other ways with other communities to successfully divert people away from the courts and away from prison. And we have been less successful. And I say we, I'm not blaming the black community for this. I'm blaming the system because how could it be that we found very successful diversion programs for indigenous youth? We, the, the Almadea Muslim community in Toronto, for example, has an arrangement with the police where when one of their kids gets into uh, some kind of a skirmish, they call the people in the faith or they call the parents first and give them a chance to not get arrested and not end up going to court because if you don't go to court then you don't go to jail and so i just think we have to uh, work harder and it's really and i'm not trying to pass the buck on this these are the the judicial system as you know or the legal system is run by principally by the province uh, and i think we have to have more of those kinds of programs that speak to uh, black young people because we all know the facts which are that once you end up in jail it's going to make your life immeasurably more difficult uh, from then on in terms of pursuing the kinds of opportunities that Deputy Mayor Thompson was talking about. And so, and I think there are policing changes that have to be made to make sure that again, if the program exists to have the police call somebody else other than just taking it down to the station and booking you to say, okay, we're gonna you know, turn you over to the community to give you a second chance and a little bit of guidance to get you out of whatever it was you were in. I think these are gonna do uh, wonders for uh, reducing those kinds of numbers you saw, which are, numbers that are not fair and and they're not um they, they shouldn't be that way uh, so i just think that those are the kinds of actions that have to be undertaken but it's also then connected to everything else we've been talking about whether it's uh, opportunity to advance at work supports to make sure you stay in school it's all tied together in terms of, of making sure you have that opportunity to grow up and to be um you know what every other a uh, young person wants to be whatever the color of their skin. And I think there are obstacles that stand in the way, including increased rates of arrest and incarceration of young, black young people, not just young, but black young people in particular, uh, that, uh, that make this almost impossible for them to achieve once they've gone to jail, for example. Can you tell us why it's important to take equity into account in program design and implementation, even in terms of the government response to situations like the coronavirus? We said from the beginning that we were going to take the data on who got COVID-19 and analyze it, including by race, because we wanted to see who was uh, more likely to contract this virus and all the things that flow from that. And of course, it would come as no surprise that people who were more likely to contract it, there is a medical reason for this, uh, that people lived in close quarters in small apartments, families of five or six people. People had jobs that were in close quarters with other people, say on industrial production lines or places like that. And they disproportionately uh, got coronavirus and disproportionately lived in certain areas of the city like the Northwest and the Northeast. Uh, you, if you don't take equity into account, then you are more likely, I suppose, to convince yourself there really isn't a problem. When in fact, if you analyze almost all the numbers, whether it is high school dropout rates, unemployment rates, rates of incarceration we discussed, rates of attracting COVID-19, uh, you know, not because anybody was breathing on them on the street, but because they were living in housing that was very crowded, they were working in jobs that were, you know, in, in more difficult working conditions that were uh, breeding ground for this virus. And so that's why you have to take equity into account so you can identify the inequity and try to remedy it. The UN has declared 
2015 to 2024 as the International Decade for People of African Descent. And many countries are doing a lot of things to recognize this. Um, and people are saying that this is the opportunity for redress, for reparation, for healing, for reconciliation, and to change the destinies of people of African descent. Now, um, what do you think can be done uh, that will be tangible enough to sort of make up for years of injustice, the historical disadvantage, and all that the people of African descent have been through. To have something like Afro-Global Television uh, and, and services like that more broadly available so that people can become aware of black achievement, black history, black uh, history in the, in the bad sense of what's happened over time that affects the way people uh, think and, and are treated today to some extent. Uh, these are all very important things, but it does start, I believe, with education, both about, I learned from the anti-black racism about things that the, I think the instructor called microaggression. And it was microaggression that wasn't intended by the person speaking, but it was microaggression that would be taken that way quite likely by the person listening. And, and these are the kinds of things that people have to be educated on. I'm so glad every staff member on the city of Toronto is going to have anti-black racism training as I had. Everyone, we've done about 4,000, I think, already, and we're going through the whole of the 30,000. Black staff network from the city of Toronto told me in a meeting I had with them a week or 10 days ago, they said, look, white people who still make up the majority of the public service in Toronto naturally will gravitate to mentoring other white people. Hopefully not out of any sense of discrimination against anybody else, but they just do what human beings do. But that imposes a huge disadvantage on black members of our public service because they don't get some of the people that are in positions of influence now to mentor them, to prepare them to take those positions on. And so we're going to have to start looking at that. We're going to have to start looking at, well, OK, how many black members of the public service are getting promoted and how many aren't? How many apply for a promotion and get it? How many don't? And, and taking a look at what extra supports, what extra education, what extra mentoring we can make sure that th th those black Torontonians who are in our public service get to give them a fair chance uh, to uh, rise up in the ranks of the public service. And it was the Black Staff Network that told me that, and I I've immediately taken it on board, and we're going to have to remedy it. And those are the one after another, those are things we're going to have to do to just change the system. And that's to our benefit, too, by the way, because we're missing a lot of bright people right now who don't happen to get mentored then they don't happen to be as well qualified because they didn't get the mentoring for the promotion and they don't get the promotion. And we're, we're being denied their talents and they're being denied the opportunity to advance in the public service. I would la now like to ask you a question about two of my favorite topics, entrepreneurship and procurement. So entrepreneurship elevates people. We know that. And we see this in communities. So what is the city of Toronto doing to make it possible for black people to participate in the city's contract procurement contracts and for board representation. You know, I have good news and bad news. The good news is, uh, since I've been mayor, I think we did it in about 2017, we brought in a social, a social procurement policy, which was meant to give small, uh, diverse-led businesses a chance to bid on city business. The bad news is that when, I think it was Deputy Mayor Thompson himself that asked a question or two uh, at a recent meeting of the executive, could you tell us how many diverse-led businesses? And I know the answer is not zero. But the fact is that the person who was being asked the question, who should have known the answer, couldn't say how many firms, like to, to a number, had benefited from this and had been actually included in the competitions and had won the business. Because I know for a fact that diverse-led businesses, including Black-owned and Black-led businesses, get a chance to compete. They will win. They won't win all the time. Nobody does. But they will win some of the time, whereas now they don't even know how to apply. And so I guess the good news is we have a policy. But when I heard that answer not given, in other words, they didn't know how many businesses had benefited, and this was maybe only a month or so ago, I knew that what we had to start to do is have much more rigorous analysis of what's going on with that policy to make sure it's actually working. And so we actually do have a policy, which is a step forward. Many, uh, many uh, city governments do not, but now we have to make it work. And so we can actually say at the end of 2020, 24 firms or 38 firms or 19 firms actually got business and another 50 competed for that business and didn't win this time, but they might win next time. Okay. Well, it's great to hear about all these programs that are out there for entrepreneurs and what's happening. I must commend, you know, the city of Toronto because, I mean, I can see a lot of work going on uh, to make sure that uh, people of African descent have equal opportunity. Now, I want us to talk a little bit more about systemic racism. Um, and this actually plays out um, not just in, in terms of people 
denied opportunities, uh, economic opportunities, but even in schools, um, a lot of the you know kids who drop out, um, it's not because you know they cannot graduate, but it, 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 they have disadvantages that are overlooked by the system. Now, equality is bringing everyone to the table, but equity is making sure that everyone on the table has the same advantage. Now, what can be done about you know century or decade-long systems that have kind of put people of African descent down? I think that some things we've done that have uh, assisted other groups, if you look at a lot of the initiatives we undertook to help women to achieve a better representation in the ranks of, and there's still lots of work to be done there too, but if you look at what, what happened there. So for example, when I was uh, at Rogers as an executive, we had a rule that said in every competition for a promotion, there had to be at least one woman on the short list. And so it meant sometimes you had to look to find just the right one that could get onto the short list. You didn't have to look that hard, actually, because there were a lot of very talented people out there. But it made you look. And, and quite often, the woman uh, that was on the short list, sometimes there's more than one, got the job. And I think, you know, I, I was with a bunch of Somali moms. I've told the story before, but it was a couple of years ago now. And they said to me, you know, we did everything we were told to do. All our kids stayed in school and we encouraged them to stay in school and so on. But then when I read about the tech boom, uh, my son or my daughter seems to have no connection to that whatsoever. So what did we do as a city? Well, we took a job fair, including with technology companies, up to the area of the city where the Somali community principally lives and took the jobs to the people. And so that is an example of something where, and there's many other examples like that, where we can be proactive and saying, okay. And that's one of the reasons why I said, I think every company should have a plan to deal with anti-black racism, which would include a plan to hire and promote more people who are black, who are Torontonians, in their own ranks because that's one of the sure uh, cures for uh, racism inside that company and, and inside the city as a whole. The better people do and the more they're seen to rise up and the more they're seen to have the chance to rise up and have a fair chance. So I think a lot of these things um, you know, are going to require some changes, but they're not changes. They're changes that at the end of the day, you end up better off because you access, have access to a much broader pool of talent. We're denying ourselves in business in technology and government, uh, that talent that exists out there now because they just are completely detached from the system uh, because they dropped out of school or because of where they live or because there's no transit where they live or because uh, they didn't have um, the access to a network because of all those things where they lived and, and what family they came from. Michael, do you want to uh, pick up I, on that? I know today that the education minister talked about streaming of young black kids, which has been happening in Ontario since I was a high school student, because I recall as one of the issues that I basically took to the then uh, leadership candidate, David Peterson, who was lead leadership for the provincial uh, liberals, who eventually became the premier, about streaming and what it was actually doing to young black kids. It still continues in Ontario today. And I know that the current government is indicating that they are going to change that. I think they'll make a big difference I would also say this, and because as, as much as we complain about the system, I think we also have to take some responsibility about it as well. I can tell you how many town hall meetings I have in my own community relating to issues around education in schools and so on, where we don't have the families who are being impacted come out so that we can hear their voices. And I think that's really important for us as a community if the change that we seek, we have to be a part of the process in order to get the changes that we want. And in as much as the system is stacked against us and systemic racism and all of those things exist, I'll give you an example. I was in a store just yesterday in my own community where I was going to buy some sandals. And I was standing in an aisle area in the Loblaws, the superstore. A woman came behind me with her young son, probably about 12. There was lots of room for her not to come behind me and to avoid me altogether. What she came behind me to say was, I can't breathe. And my reaction, of course, stunned as it was at the moment, because this was happening in my own community. I just looked at her and attempted to move forward. Recognizing that as a problem, I'm obviously going to do something about it. I'm just saying that things happen even when you don't expect it. So as members of the black community, 
the, the changes that we want, and yes, we want others to help us, and that's important because of the way the system is structured. We have to actually be out there communicating the concerns. I don't see enough of this, and so the educational changes that we want requires us to be fully involved and engaged in order to change the structure. I like that advice. You know, it, it is said that you have to raise your hand to be counted. So we, we have to do all we can to make sure that we're, you know, raising our hands and sitting on those tables. Now, uh, we're going to actually um, take a moment to share a little video, um, just about two minutes or so long. Um, this is a story um, that is part of a documentary called The Science of Racism produced by Silver Trust Media in partnership with the Canadian Race Relations Foundation. It will soon be on Canadian television. Um, so we'll just um, take this you know, break, watch the video, and when we come back, we'll be joined by Professor Afua Cooper and Kit Merritt. So stay with us. Orlando Bowen, now a member of the Board of Directors for the Canadian Race Relations Foundation, is a motivational speaker founder and executive director of the One Voice, One Team Youth Leadership Organization. Orlando's professional sports career was cut short due to injuries from a racially motivated assault by the police that almost ended his life. I played hard and studied hard. I graduated twice, did a bachelor's degree and a master's degree. I played three seasons with the Toronto Argonauts. Um, I then played one season with the Hamilton Tiger Cats and had signed a contract extension and was about to go out and celebrate that extension um, when the assault happened. And I see two guys walking towards me and one guy says, hey man, do you have any drugs? And I'm thinking, oh, here we go. No, I don't. And I go back to my phone call. Now he stopped at the rear of my vehicle. The guy that was with him kept walking. So the gentleman that stopped says, are you sure? You sure you don't have anything? And I'm thinking, why would he be asking me if I'm sure? I answered his question, they grabbed me, they were both armed, got me down to the ground, started to beat me till, you know, skin on my head split. And I was there and I was just thinking, I can't believe I'm gonna die like this. It ended up that the two gentlemen were two corrupt undercover police officers um, who were employed by the police service that I worked with a lot. I was a spokesperson for a number of their uh, events and initiatives. I went out with their officers into schools to empower and equip young people to stand up for the right thing. So because I had worked with so many amazing officers who believe in community and believe in young people, I was convinced that, you know, someone was gonna stand up and say something. Of course they would, that's what we stand for, that's how we live and that's what we equip young people to do. I knew that that was gonna happen until it didn't. And a number of them would come to me privately and say, I, I wish I could say something, but I can't because I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to be, I don't want it to seem as though I'm not a team player. I wish I could help you, Orlando. The assault itself, um, it was a challenge in that it ended my football career because I was concussed and I couldn't even like, you know, I couldn't pass my physicals. I couldn't even like walk without losing my balance. Uh, but uh, while we were going through that process, uh, one of the officers, actually the arresting officer, was himself arrested uh, for trafficking cocaine. They found, you know, um, multiple kilos of cocaine at his house. I was acquitted. You know, it, it, was, it was bittersweet, you know, uh, because folks are like, that's amazing. Like, you won. And I was thinking, what did we win? We shouldn't have been in this situation in the first place. We're wasting taxpayers' money. We're wasting our own contributions. We sh these type of things should not happen. Welcome to the second part of our program. So we have two amazing individuals joining us right now. First is Professor Afua Cooper. Professor Afua Cooper is a multidisciplinary scholar and artist. She holds a PhD in history from the University of Toronto. In 2017, she completed her term as the James Robinson Johnson Chair in Black Canadian Studies at Dalhousie University, where she is a professor in the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences. 
Dr. Afua Cooper served as the Poet Laureate of Halifax Regional Municipality for the term 2018 to 2020. Her 12 books range across such genres. Her book, The Hanging of Angelique, The Untold Story of Slavery in Canada, and The Burning of Old Montreal, was named by CBC as one of Canada's best books and was a finalist for the Governor General's Award. Her novels, My Name is Henry Bibb, and my name is Phyllis Whitley, won national and international awards. Dr. Cooper has received numerous acknowledgements for her work, including a Governor General's Award nomination, a nomination for the Harry Drum Award for Professional Excellence, the Historica Canada Award, and the Planet Africa Renaissance Award. Welcome, Dr. Cooper. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, we also have Kate Merritt, a 33-year veteran of York Regional Police and a two-time president of the Association of Black Law Enforcers. He co-founded the Citizenship Initiative Group. He served in corporate development as an officer in charge of professional development, which includes staff development and recruiting. He also served in the Drugs and Vice Unit, where he was an undercover officer taxed with the infiltrating criminal groups involved in illegal drug distribution. At the Training and Education Bureau, he worked as a primary educator and instructor in the use of force and as well as a primary facilitator of the York Regional Police Employment, Equity and Race Relations Program. In 2013, Kate received the Queen's Diamond Jubilee Medal and in 2018, he received the Harry Jerome Award. Welcome, Kate. Thank you, Patricia. It's a pleasure being here. Okay, Dr. Cooper, let's begin with you. So let's start with a history of slavery in Canada. Dr. Cooper, can you shed light on what happened in Canada regarding slavery? I would like to say that Canada as a colonial construct, from the very beginning of that history, we've had enslavement of African people. Um, the first uh, record we have dates back to 1628, when a young child who was subsequently named Olivier Lejeune was enslaved in Quebec City by one of Samuel de Champlain's friends. Samuel de Champlain, as you know, was known as the father of Quebec or the father of Canada. And as the century closed, as the 17th century closed, so by the time we get to 1700, um, uh, most of the black people within the colony that subsequently we call Canada were enslaved people, were people who, who were stolen from Africa or the West Indies or the 13 American colonies to the South or the children that they had who were born in, in, in the colonies um, were enslaved people. So if we go from 1628 and then to 1760, when we had the conquest of Canada, which meant that the British defeated the French and sort of took control of the co this colonial construct that we call Canada from Acadia in the east, which is pretty much Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, PEI, to the Detroit River frontier, um, southwestern Ontario, Michigan, all the way down to Ohio. Ohio that was considered a uh, part of Canada. Um, so from, from that eastern portion to the western portion, all of what we now call Upper Canada or Ontario or Quebec, uh, and so on, um, black people were enslaved. And that was a principal um, experience of black people within Canada until 1834. So the British took over in 1760. And um, in fact, when the British took over the, the colony of Canada, shall we say, the enslavement of black people actually increased because by the middle of the 18th century, Britain is of course the principal slave holding nation and they were able to transport more enslaved Africans, especially from the 13 colonies to the south and from the Caribbean, as I've mentioned. And um, in 1833, 34, slavery was finally abolished in uh, Britain's overseas colonies, which uh, at the time included Canada. So we are looking at a, over two centuries of enslavement of black people in Canada. And if you think of it, we have been enslaved longer than we have been free, not only within Canada, but within the Americas as a whole. So it's a, a long and, and, and cruel history 
for which um, restitution has not been given. Um, but even before we give restitution, we have to recognize that that history happened. One of the interesting things within Canadian history, within Canadian studies, is that when it comes to the whole issue of enslavement within Africa, that's kind of minimized or denied. Um, a person was owned by another person. And in this case, the black was owned by the white. And whatever that black person produced, or the free labor, wealth, um, producing wealth for other people over centuries, their children were owned not by, by, by them, but by the owners uh, typically of the mother. So they created wealth, um, they gave um, free labor of themselves and their children to white people. Uh, our lineage was fractured, our um, culture was stolen from us. We are here speaking the English language as black people or French or Spanish or whatever European language it may be. But we know that's not our original language. Um, so our culture was stolen, our heritage fractured, our lineage fra fractured. My name is Cooper. That's really not my name. It's the name that came down through my father's lineage. And it wasn't his name either. Uh, we trace it back to Scotland, um, in Inverness, Scotland, in the Scottish Highland, when three uh, slave trading Scottish brothers came to Jamaica, Western Jamaica, and opened a plantation and then bought Africans to that plantation and gave them the name Cooper. So what is my name? So, you know, sometimes when people talk about reparation, it's not simply about money. We are also looking at culture. We're also looking at fractured lineages. What is my name? What is our name? So that's just to give you, you know, an overview of slavery in Canada from 1628 to 1834. And it, it was spread across all of what we call the five original colonies, including Newfoundland. From the video we just watched, we can see that police brutality can cost people a lifetime opportunity. Orlando Bowen, who was a professional player, ended up not playing anymore, and he also ended up in jail, an innocent man. And this has cost so many people their lives. It has, you know, cost so much. And I think seeing this video just brings it to life. Now, my question is, what can be done to address systemic racism in the police? And, you know, Kate, you uh, were um, in the police force for about 30, you know, three years, and you actually have first-hand experience as an officer who is from the black community. What have you to say about systemic racism in the force? Let's talk a little bit about the police service itself. And I'm gonna to talk to you from three perspectives. One uh, being a, a police officer for 30 plus years. And, and also I'm gonna to talk to you and address uh, the people that are listening about being a, a citizen, I'm now retired. And the third point is I'm a black man and I've been black all my life. I've experienced prejudice, racism from a boy to a man. So that's a perspective that I'm going to be speaking uh, to you about. 30 plus years ago, I joined the York Regional Police and uh, I was an anomaly. There were only another one other black individual on the service at that time. So think about it, 30 plus years ago, uh, we were not represented anywhere in Ontario uh, in any significant numbers at all. I'm talking about black officers. It stands true that you had to, as a black man, you had to stand out, meaning that you had to do three times the work. You had to produce three times the work just to get legitimacy. It was tough. Uh, you would walk into a criminal investigations office as a black officer and the, the racial epithets that were, that were leveled against you uh, openly. Uh, the, the type of language that was used uh, was incredible. It wouldn't stand today, but that's what it was back in the day. In terms of 
systemic problems in the police service going back 30 years up to this point. I can speak from experience. I was denied uh, many, many courses that I should have been on. I served as, for three years as an undercover officer and they never once sent me to a course dealing with drugs or issues about how to manage yourself out in the street where a number of the other white officers who some of them were not in the, even in the drug squad got the course. So remember three years, not a single course. I did the race relations and employment equity for three years, again in the service. I had to go out and get my own courses. They denied me every single course. Why? In terms of elevation, in terms of promotions, um, it took me 16 years before I was promoted to the rank of sergeant. There are a number of people that I had trained that eight and nine and 10 years, they were promoted above me. Why? Uh, evaluations were all very good, outstanding. Um, I did all that I needed to do to attain that rank and it never came. Even when I moved up the ranks, there were barriers in front of me. Uh, you know, uh, through the interviews, uh, through um, the uh, assessments that they gave me, you don't have a degree, you don't have this, you haven't worked there. Well, yeah, you haven't put me in the specialized units and okay, I'll get a degree. I did. And again, the promotions were denied. In essence, what I'm saying is that it, it actually even transcends uh, policing because, uh, as you know, I, I worked uh, as the president of the Association of Black Law Enforcers, and we, we deal with the criminal justice system. And we, even within that system, uh, there were problems in terms of uh, work relations and uh, discrimination biases and all the rest of that. Just listening to you. Uh, you know, you get angry, you get sad, you get frustrated. Just to, I can imagine the tenure of your career and what you've experienced. And then hearing Dr. Cooper talk about Canada's role in slavery. And then, of course, watching Orlando's, um, you know, clip from the documentary, you get, you get angry, you get sad, you get frustrated. Uh, Patricia, what you don't know is Orlando and I both worked for the Toronto Argos at the same time. He was a football player and I was a cheerleader. And I remember Orlando being around and always really friendly and great guy to hang out with. And then the next year he was gone. We didn't know. We did not know what happened. We didn't know what happened. So it just, you know, that video touches me hearing what you're saying. Keith touches me and hearing what Dr. Cooper just has an impact. So now I want to talk about anti-Black racism. So Dr. Cooper, this question is for you. Anti-Black racism is prejudice, attitudes, beliefs, stereotyping, or discrimination that is directed at people of African descent and rooted in their unique history. Dr. Cooper, can you speak a little bit about anti-Black racism? I would say that anti-Black racism is um... It's at the core of Western ideological thought with regards to racial thinking. Um, as the slave trade got into, you know, um, became really animated, intensified, the enslavers needed a philosophy or an ideology uh, with which to justify this process of enslavement. How do you take a people, Africans in this case, and treat them worse than animals. So in order to justify the slave trade and slavery, Africans were cast out of the human race. Just look at the theories of people like Immanuel Kant and John Hobbes. These are some of the principal names in Western, in Western philosophy. So uh, uh, Thomas Jefferson, who uh, you know, thought that black people could not were not fully human and there was no redemption for black people. Um, we, di we didn't have light skin, we didn't have straight hair. He, he thought that the Native American or the indigenous people stood a chance 
because they had lighter skin and straight hair and they could be assimilated into <laughs> humanity, but certainly not black people. And this thought was at the core, this idea was at the core of, of what um, people think of as education. Our leading intellectuals thought that way, ordinary white people thought that way. So anti-black racism was at the very core of Western thinking. But when slavery ended, uh, whichever emancipation we had, whether it's Brazil or British Caribbean or Canada or United States, that thought didn't disappear. We didn't have a psychological intervention. It's not as if nowadays you can go to a course and, or, or, or teaching and learn certain things. Um, that didn't happen. The enslavers said, okay, you're free, go live your life, but we're still gonna control the social, economic, and political order. You're still gonna work for us. We still see you as inferior, as servile. So that thinking was still in place in the minds of the enslavers who became the leaders of the uh, post-emancipation society. It was also not the psychological intervention in the minds of black people. Many of us still suffered from internalized racism, we still um, saw ourselves as uh, servile and inferior, and whether or not we were conscious of it. And that's why, you know, the psychology, psychology is so important. It's like an iceberg in what we are talking about. When you look at an iceberg, you see the top part of it that's visible from the surface of the sea upward. But that's a small, smaller part of it. The bulk of the iceberg is, with, is inside of the ocean itself, beneath the surface of the sea. And it's even more dangerous than what you're seeing because it's hidden. You can't see it. And so I think it's with us, all races, that the anti-Black racism is still um, beneath the surface of the sea. And until you do that consciousness work to bring it up, to uh, bring it up to the surface, we will continue to be victims of it. And that's why, um, and it pervades throughout all society. There are other races, um, colored, uh, let me say people of color who are anti-Black. There are some Black people who are anti-Black. So it's this idea that was put in place, one could say, with the advent of, you know, the Colombian um, so-called discoveries, to the new world, the stealing of people from Africa, imperialism and colonialism in Africa, that it, it became the superstructure that we're now dealing with in every aspect of our life. Wow, that is so deep. And I must say that what you have, you know, delved into is something that we have to have another town hall to discuss. And we're working on having one on healing because you talked about mental and psychological um, you know, parts of the struggle that we face as people of African heritage. Now, um, I'd like us to talk a little bit more about our young people. Our young people, um, I see, you know, generational trauma. For instance, my kids, they've experienced racism a few times at school. Um, two kids have been expelled from school because of one of my daughters. The other day, my daughter was part of a play and she, you know, made it, you know, to playing the um, supporting role. And as soon as we went in for the physical audition, as soon as the lady saw that we were black, she said, oh, you cannot play the sister of the princess. Maybe you can play the little mouse. So I said, but why? And she said, she's not going to be able to learn the lines. And I said, how do you know? And she insisted. Um, I decided not to have my daughter participate. And I asked for my money back. I never got my $800 back. How do we raise up children, you know, who would be able to go and face the world and be equal participants in the game of life with other people when society is sort of showcasing images of them that are not elevating. So my question now is, what can be done, not just by the government, but by us as a community, um, to help our young people, to make sure they're not overrepresented in the prison? And, and, and the mayors can jump in here as well. 
Um, so Kate, as I'll start with you. What can we do? What are the strategic steps that we can take and put in place to make sure that the future is better than the past? One of the uh, things that we did at the Association of Black Law Enforcers was we engaged in the community directly. We were there, we were present. We also did that as part of the York Regional Police. We attended as many events as possible and there were a variety of events, but our key focus was the young people that attended these events and we spent time with them. The time that we spent with them was very, very valuable because they got a chance to find out who we were. They had a chance to ask us about what we faced, how we handled it, and where we are now in the present. And we gave them an opportunity to follow the lead. We brought them along with us. We exposed them to uh, a number of different uh, professions, uh, different way of thinking, uh, different dynamics. And uh, we've had some really, really good results. And, uh, and, uh, and, and we also have spent time um, in the schools, which is, which is critical. Um, we know that if we get to these young people early enough, then we can make changes that are significant. And just by being present is probably one of the biggest things that we can do, not absent, but present. We should have a time where we have a week strike, a month strike or a semester strike and not send our children to school. I don't know how we're going to figure that out in terms of childcare, but the white society has been trampling on black people for so long and sending our children out into the white dominated school system is actually killing them psychologically. I mean, what does that do to your daughter when she's so hyped, so pumped to be in that play? I know she's told she can't be in that play. And we see that across the board. So we, we, we need radical action. We have to find a way to let the school realize, and those teachers, those very racist teachers, that if they continue to mess with our kids, they're going to be losing their jobs. We saw that case in Ottawa, the Bye Bye Blackburn case, for example, with the school trustee in, in Ottawa. They're going to be losing their jobs. We keep home more children. We have a strike. We have a blackout in whatever aspect because the children are our future, as you rightly identified. And if our future is being damaged over and over and over again, what kind of future do we have? You know, the indigenous people talk about uh, down to the seventh generation. You're from Nigeria. You know, you know, you also have that saying in your culture, looking down to many generations in order to keep up to keep up the community. And if our future, our children are being damaged over by the police, by the education system, especially the education system, because that's where we leave them for most of the day. They spend more time with their teachers than they spend with us. Then we have to resort to radical action. So if we have a blackout of the school system and sue the school system, sue Peel Board, sue York Region, school, sue Toronto, school board, sue the Catholic school, sue Halifax, have a lawsuit all across the country. It will change. It will change and people will say, okay, the Negroes are revolting. Well, yeah, it's high time that the black people revolt because they have been tampering with our lives and destroying our lives for centuries. We are not mendicants. We are not beggars as um, the, the man in, in, the, in the film that you show talk about taxpayers. We are taxpayers, we uphold the system. It's our very wealth, our talents, our skills um, that have contributed so much and have upheld the system. The, the, um, the a police officer from, from your region talked about working three times as hard. We, we know that it, it's across the board and to think you have to wait 16 years for a promotion, to think we, and we tell that to our children. But I stopped telling that to my children. I said, why should I have to tell them that they have to work three times as hard 
to get rid of a mediocre white person, um, you know, attain that level? Why should they have to work three times as hard? It's almost like we're saying they're superhuman, but that's what this system has done to us. They have either made us superhuman or subhuman, and we have to respond with radical action. Dr. Cooper's um, uh, comments are, 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 you know, um, ideas that has to be woven into an integrated system in which we also advocate and participate and get really engaged in the structure that exists because our tax dollars are funding the education system. So we're not asking for handouts. Um, we have to be there to advocate for our children and to express um, our thoughts and concerns for the things that are needed. And I know, yes, a lot of black parents are working two or three jobs just to make ends meet, and it's difficult for them to attend all the meetings and so on. But we work really hard with our community to help our young people through the involvement of their parents, through the involvement of their community, but also investment from the city of Toronto in after school initiatives that have helped our young kids with their homework and so on. We've seen that that makes a difference. And I realize that it's not across the board. The point I think that in combination with Dr. Cooper's comments is that we have to hold the system accountable. But the provincial system is, uh, educational system is the area where we have to go. But additionally, though, there are things that can be done with your municipal government in collaboration with the community to bring about the changes that we need. We know that prejudice and racism mostly stem from ignorance and lack of information and lack of education. The Canadian school curriculum does not currently include Black History Month. Black History, and I'm not talking about Black History Month. Why is it important to make Black History part of the school curriculum? With respect to um, taking over the education of our children, what Michael said, on point and solid. I just want to add another point to that. And drawing from an example here in Nova Scotia, which is the indigenous community here is the Mi'kmaq community. And for a while now, maybe at least 10 years, at least, um, the Mi'kmaq community, the elders, the, the chiefs, the other community leaders have taken over the education of Mi'kmaq children. And in, you know, in 2002, Mi'kmaq children and um, Black Nova Scotian children were at the bottom of the pyramid in terms of reading, writing, and arithmetic, at the very bottom. Not graduating high school, dropping you know, all of that. The community took over the education of their youth, and today we have wonderful results. The children, not everyone, but the, the rates have increased dramatically are graduating from high school, they are going on to university, some of them are going on to professional school, and that was when the community took control of the education of their youth. And I think the black community has to do that wherever, otherwise our youth will keep um, being thrown down the drain because the system is anti-black and the system promotes white supremacy. Now, here's why I think, I know, not I think, I know it's important that we have black history and not just something from February 1 to February 28th, but throughout the entire uh, year. And it has to be woven within the curriculum. As far as I know, there's no school board in Canada that has uh, black history or black studies, um, the learning of black history, let's say, as an objective at the end of the school year. So that by grade 10, the children will have learned this or that, or, you know, in grade 12, when they write all those exams and they have to show that they have absorbed this knowledge. None. It's left up to a conscientious teacher, usually a black teacher, um, to say, okay, guys, you're going to learn something about Viola Desmond. So we have to hold school boards accountable, but this is woven into the fabric of the curriculum. We're talking about the black community as being one of the oldest uh, uh, non-indigenous communities in, in, in Canada. We're talking about 1604 with Matthew de Costa or even before that. Um, as the black community, when, when you think of it, and this sometimes startles people, 
has been here longer than the British community. And the British community in colonial parlance has been seen as one of the founding people. Well, black people have been here before Britain even gained a toehold on the North American continent or in, on the Canadian landscape as a colonizing power, 1604 with Matthew de Cossack, 1608. So we have to be, now challenge more than ever this white supremacy in education and say, we are taxpayers, I'm going to withdraw my, ch withdraw my child, I'm going to homeschool my child, or whatever alternative we come up with. But it has to be, it cannot be just on February uh, 1st to 28th. And I had a situation here when I moved to um, Nova Scotia in Halifax, at the high school my daughter was going, and the principal looked me in my face and said, there won't be a Black History Month this year because the teacher who usually does it, a Black teacher, is gone off to another school. I couldn't believe it. I simply couldn't believe it. So Black History Month was canceled. And, um, and, uh, and, you know, he felt no way about saying that. So the time for begging is over. People have to be held accountable. And at the end of the day, we are not mendicants. We are not beggars. And I want everyone listening on the show to realize that and to stand strong and to be strong for yourself and for your children. So many of our ancestors have died. I mean, I remember Len Brathway talking about the banning of the book, Little Black Sambo. That was in 1957. <laughs> you know, that's so many, well, over 60 years now that the black community has been fighting for the education of their children and even before. But 1957 was a pivotal year because that's when the Toronto School Board banned the, the book Little Black Sambo from you know, part of the, 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 the reading list of the student, which really degraded black children, that book. Now we'll just go to the Q&A session. Um, and um, there's a question here um, in the chat uh, from Franklin and is asking, he says, I want the city of Toronto uh, and the mayors to say what happened to Devon Miller was wrong. And this is, and what steps they are taking to make sure that this never happens again. It's, it's really important for your, uh, the participants and folks uh, posing the question to recognize that that incident did not actually happen in the city of Toronto. It happened in Durham region, which is a, uh, an area where we don't have any jurisdiction over in terms of policing. While we were all very concerned what has happened to this young man, uh, I don't believe that we have the ability to um, affect their, um, the, the way that their police service board acts or their service as, as such. Uh, clearly, um, in the city of Toronto, um, we would have something to, to say about this directly. Indirectly, we're all very concerned as to what has happened with this young man who, through no fault of his own, in essence, um, has lost an eye and has been beaten. And uh, we know the results. In fact, I spoke out about this on the radio on the day that the, 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 the judge brought his, um, his verdict down. Um, which was simply a simple assault, which sort of suggests that he just got, you know, slapped on, on, on the back or so by someone. And, but we know that he was brutalized, he was beaten, he lost an eye, and it clearly was aggravated. But it seems, that, again, the systemic system has uh, seen a, a verdict that um, I believe strongly was unjust. So I, I'm not to suggest that we don't want to comment on this particular issue as such. I can comment on it from afar as we can comment on other issues, but the, the jurisdiction is not Toronto. I just wanted to make sure that uh, everyone's aware of that. Deputy Mayor Thompson is right. However, people should know uh, there are proceedings that are, uh, that are underway in Toronto, disciplinary proceedings vis-a-vis uh, -vis the officers the one that's a Toronto police officer, but they could not proceed until the criminal proceedings were over. And frankly, to be candid about it, if there's an appeal from the criminal conviction, it can't proceed before that appeal's over because they can't prejudice the criminal trial by having these disciplinary proceedings. So there are two more uh, uh, proceedings to happen. One is an internal Toronto police disciplinary proceeding and one is an independent investigation by the Waterloo police of the 
incident so that it isn't being done by Toronto Police because a Toronto Police officer was involved. And so I can just assure you the police board in Toronto is equally interested in getting to the bottom of how this ever could have happened, even though the councillor, Deputy Mayor Thompson, is right, it happened in Durham. So, you know, the actual jurisdiction over what happened and where the courts were and so on was in Durham. But this is not over. It's just in one of those stages where because of trying to protect everybody's rights, uh, the, the other two sets of proceedings haven't yet started or have just now started. So I see another question in the chat. It's talking about data, and I know you had commented on this earlier. Does the city currently collect any sort of race-based data? Yes, in the police service, and that was something that was initiated in the past 18 months. Uh, frankly, under my leadership as mayor and on the police board, it had been talked about for years, and it's now being done. Uh, we haven't got enough data yet to start to analyze it and see what it says, because it was just started within the last, literally the last year. Uh, we are doing it in respect of COVID-19, um, and so I'm not aware if we're collecting any other uh, data or disaggregating it by race, but I can just assure you that if I think it is in the best interest of providing equity and uh, you know getting to the bottom of systemic racism or anything else that I will not hesitate um, you know again always within the bounds of the legal advice we get and people's privacy concerns and whatnot you have to respect those but I wouldn't hesitate to say yes to looking at that data because it helps us a lot to determine the size and scale of a problem and, and uh, maybe what to do about it so uh, I would say there are the two instances I'm aware of I'm just not aware of whether we're doing it anywhere else but I'm also not aware of any prohibition against doing it uh, so um, so through uh, what's called TESS, the Toronto Employment and Social Services, we do collect information in order to help us to serve our clients. And we want to know who those clients are. We want to know where we need to invest our funds uh, to help people. And uh, so we do gather information and data to help us with respect to administering the, the resources that are necessary to help um, our clients and many of them are black people and indigenous people and so we do gather that information to be able to help us be able to help the clients who we believe uh, need to have the resources allocated in, in a fair and a, 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 a way that helps to, to bring about differences to have impact. The next question, I'd like to combine two questions here. The first one is asking uh, is from Ronald and is asking why do we need to justify the need for black history beyond slavery in our schools? Why is it not important? We need to hold the system accountable. That's from Ronald. And then Franklin is saying what can be done to have a bylaw against anti-black racism? Well, laws change actions, not discussions, he says. So these are two questions. The first one is on Black History Month and the second one is anti-black racism for a law to be passed. I agree with the person who asked the question. It uh, has to be, as we have said before, not just a month, but certainly interwoven in the curriculum um, throughout the school year. And yes, beyond slavery, no one is um, saying that it should be only on slavery. Slavery was certainly, a, uh, you know, the United Nations said, perhaps the most traumatic experience um, to anybody during the course of modern history. So it, I mean, I, I would say, I love to say that's because of slavery why we're here, we're even on a Zoom, right? And, and I want, want to take the opportunity to say that now we're home, at least some of us because of the COVID-19 pandemic, and we have all these Zoom meetings and we have our tablets and we have our phones and we have our, I, um, uh, you know, or Mac Air or what have you. And this technology would not be possible <laughs> without the African continent, without those minerals from places like the Congo and Niger and Chad, the Colton, that are used to power these devices. And so, you know, a big shout out to the African continent. And, you know, the, the people in Africa are not benefiting from this technology. We see the children working in the mines in the Congo. We see people being displaced so that Western nations can go and, and mine this precious thing that's used to, to run our, our, our laptops. So I would like something like, you know, the use of coltan and African minerals to, that powers Western technology to be something on the curriculum. You know, we as parents and um, aunties and uncles and friends and neighbors should also be teaching this 
children. And if we don't know it, we go and learn it and bring it into our homes. All right, I have a question. It's a law enforcement question. So Keith Merritt, uh, Deputy Mayor Thompson, Mayor Tory. So you recently spoke about outsourcing some of the activities that the police service currently handles. Do you think this is another form of defunding the police force? Um, so uh, I'll start. And um, so having spent uh, four years on the police service board and having been part of that group who attempted in uh, 2012, uh, 2013, to get the police to reduce their budget by 10%. We were able to get them to get to 4.6%, and the other 5.4% was supposed to come um, thereafter. We saw the challenges um, in terms of getting to that number. And by the way, it wasn't just simply reducing or the budget, but there are legal implication, uh, contract implications, um, the, the number of police officers and so on that they have. And so what we found that would be a best vehicle for us to implement, which we did, was we looked at what we call modernization. We brought in KPMG to help us to identify areas in which the police could be divested of. And so, so detasking them from those responsibilities. One of the ones was the issue around mental health, the other issues such as uh, parking enforcement, for example, it's part of the police budget. That's a $24 million amount. There were other areas as well in which we uh, looked at the, even the complement in terms of the number of police officers. 90% of the police budget is straight salaries. So on a budget of one one billion seventy six million, um, it's nine hundred and seventy eight, or just rounded off to nine hundred and eighty million dollars. So you're left with either ninety eight or one hundred and eight million dollars that you're left with. And so this idea that you would simply, uh, you know, reduce the budget by ten percent when you have a number of other areas where the police department or the police service board itself can go to to seek redress of a council directed action to reduce the budget. One is the police act itself. The other, obviously, because the province is engaged in that decision, whether or not they support the reduction in terms of the budget. The other is what's called the OCPC, which is the Ontario Civilian Police Commission, who actually um, integrates itself into the mix of the act itself and the administration of what can be done. And so, Detasking is an approach that we've taken to address this particular issue as part of the motion that I and the mayor and, and another member of council were instrumental in constructing. We also identi identified the areas in which uh, the confronting anti-black racism strategy in our plan that we want to implement and put more investments in. As the person responsible for what's called social development finance in the city, that a lot of the um, anti-black racism and a lot of the issues in terms of helping to invest in social services. Since 2013, the city of Toronto has, in, has invested, has invested over $300 million in this area. And at the same time, I know policing has gone up by $200 million. I'm just giving you a relative um, uh, you know, sense in terms of what that looks like. And so the efforts to deal with the issue of the police and uh, the divestment of them and, and defunding of them, really it's an approach that's workable that we've put forward, which will get to reducing the budget, which will get to detasking them off you know, the services that they're doing, which ultimately will help in terms of the number of police officers, will help in terms of the budgetary situation, and I realize that there's been a lot of emotion as a result of George Floyd and systemic racism and other issues accounting to uh, regarding police. We, we heard about Orlando Bolin in terms of what has happened to him. A lot of that has happened to a lot of people. A lot of black people have gotten killed. And I understand the emotion. But from a, um, you know, a, a, a legislative perspective, we also have to go through a process. And that's what you saw we went through last Monday at City Council.
I definitely agree with the deputy mayor. Uh, he's uh, so on point. Uh, there's a lot of uh, different uh, implications in uh, taking money away from the service. Um, and he is correct. There are clearly 90% of that budget is to uh, pay staff. Uh, so uh, it, it becomes a little tricky at the end, um, you know, when you are talking about uh, defunding. It's probably more uh, in terms of reallocation, I think, uh, with the funds and, and the deputy uh, mayor has suggested a number of uh, initiatives, uh, such as having, you know, um, medical teams and uh, professionals, sociologists and, and the like that attend uh, calls uh, where police uh, don't need to be. Uh, we don't have the skill sets for that. But I think it's important that we kind of drill down a little bit, uh, especially with what has been happening lately in terms of uh, the police officers and coming into contact with people uh, primarily of color and uh, the, uh, the people end up dead. Um, what I'm going to suggest to you is, is this. I think we, we need, in terms of police training, we need better decision making. So that's, that's in terms of training. But what I saw that really, really disturbed me is that in most of these incidents that happen in contact with civilians and police, there are other officers there. And what I saw for the, the most part is that they did not act. They did not act. And that to me suggests that we have a real big problem and a huge gap in terms of our training. Police service, they should be trained in de-escalation. Sometimes we even have to go as far as disengagement to a point, but we need to have them accountable. When they are on scene and an officer is clearly out of control, it is incumbent upon them to stop that behavior, interject and take over sound, calm, rational decision-making. And I don't see that in any of the police training that I've been a part of. And that is a huge gap in what we need to fill. We have to do that. Well, I suggested, and it's now something that's before the board, that we first of all look at adding some training. So instead of just trying to jam more into the 20 weeks, add some training. And I would say like add weeks of training, not just a day or two. And secondly, maybe have that extra training take place outside of the police college. So it could be done at Humber College or at U of T or at, you know, you name a place where it's going to be people with lived experience and people who are, you know, experts, as, as was just said, uh, experts in dealing with uh, de-escalation and things like that, as opposed to uh, police officers. And that's no offense to police training. I'm sure police training does some, some of the things it's supposed to do, but we need to do much better. I think that means much more training. Uh, and I think it means training perhaps done outside of the police college so that you've got maybe another four weeks that are added on things that are best taught outside of the police college by somebody who's not of the police, uh, you know, establishment as it were. I was just thinking um, with all, all that said, I remember when the couple years ago, maybe three years ago, when that um, white guy drove his van into the crowd at Young and Shepherd, he had some beef against women and he wanted to kill as many women as possible. He also killed some men. He killed 11 people and he drove his van into the crowd. Um, and he was taken down by a police officer without a shot fired. He wasn't killed. The, the offender wasn't killed. That we all saw it on TV. The police officer who was of Korean heritage went took him down, handcuffed him without firing a shot, without killing him, without beating him. And that always stuck in my mind. So here you take down a killer who just killed 11 people and injured uh, new, dozens of other persons, and he was taken down. So it tells me, and maybe I'm wrong, but it tells me that police can de-escalate situation. And this was one man. It was like a whole crew of them, one individual who took down that criminal um, murderer. And so when in the past uh, time, uh, recent times in, in here in the Maritimes and in Ontario and other places in North America, we see police interacting with primarily people of color and the uh, person of color ended up dead. So there, 
is it a color thing that's going on? So here's this white guy that killed all these people, but he was taken down, taken down, handcuffed, and, and booted off to, to jail. So uh, the mayor earlier also talked about the anti-black racism, that the training that he took and 4,000 um, members of the city staff took and there are 80,000 city employees and it's hopefully all of them will take it. Well, can the police also get that training? Can the police also, every single police officer take a, a course, whatever the course is, in anti-black racism? They have already started to get that training. Okay. Within the police, within the within police the Toronto police okay. units. Oh, okay. So is our transit, our TTC, we're going the whole gambit in terms of the training process. And so we're expanding that. In fact, last council move, meeting, I moved a motion seconded by the mayor that every single member of our uh, city services uh, have the, that service, including council members as well. There is nothing more powerful than giving your testimony live and direct with, with emotion, with passion, talking about the incidents that have happened, why they've happened, how can you treat us better? How can we deal with you better? There's nothing more powerful than having that face-to-face -face contact. And you know what? If I was the chief of police, every member of that service, whether you uh, work for the, re the radio room or you are uh, the custodial, everybody, everybody in that police service would have that interaction. There is nothing more powerful than that. They can hear us talk on, on Zoom and talk about issues here and there, but standing in front of somebody and telling them your lived experience, that's the key. As I said earlier, this is the first of many programs that we're going to be having in this series, Together for Change. Now, uh, finally, I would just like each and every one of you to make a comment, a quick comment about systemic racism and the way forward. So like your last word, um, I would like to start from you, uh, Dr. Cooper. So one last word about systemic racism and the, the way forward. And I hope the mayor is going to come back. We'd we'll like to hear um, his final word on this before we um, actually close. The way forward for me is that the, the people, the people empower themselves, that black people empower themselves. And we see how literally and figuratively the walls of Jericho, the statues, etc., cetera, uh, are, are um, tumbling down, right? That happens when people take power, when power is to the people. When people realize that they're, they're strong inside, that they're citizens, that they are um, human beings, that their children, is, is, uh, their children is like gold, when they are able to empower themselves, then everything will change. Everything will change. Okay, Dr. Mayo. Let me say this, I, I'm not hopeful of this issue of addressing or eliminating racism, systemic or otherwise. I think that it will always be there. Much, peop much will, uh, will be done to try to address it. People are really smart. They will suppress it and suppress it and suppress it until they're given permission, as I think most of the world seem to have been given permission by Donald Trump and policing and so on. Yes, there's great efforts and there are many amazing people who will work through this and will not exhibit it, but there's a tendency for it to occur. Let me give you an example. I roomed with, I was born in Jamaica and I had two roommates in Montreal. Both were white Jamaicans. And I recall the first time that one of the brothers used the N word to me in the kitchen of our apartment in Montreal. And they had spent so much time talking about Jamaica, how we were all one and out of many one people and so on and so forth. And I didn't have to go too far to actually see racism. It was in my kitchen that I shared with these two uh, white Jamaicans. And so, um, I think that our efforts should be focusing on economic advancement, educational advancement, focusing on our um, internal blackness of gathering and spending monies amongst the community and so on. 
Yes, there are a lot of people who want to help, but I think that the structural changes that we want, there's a lot of investment, a lot of work that's going to take place, no doubt, but I don't think that the history of systemic racism, the history of racism will be eradicated in as much time as we as black people try to spend to address it so that we can have peace and tranquility. Our peace and tranquility will come from us being educated, us having changing the laws and the rules and the regulations, having more of us being elected to elect elected office, being there at the decision-making table where we can put in place um, you know, our actions and recommendations to change the structure. And while some may not like it, the structure has changed. So we have to work internally, we have to educate ourselves, and we have to actually love each other and work together to bring about the changes that we want. And it can't be simply that we're always asking for permission to do things. We have to actually feel that we have an entitlement to make things happen for ourselves in our best interest and to bring others along who want to work with us, but to hope that everyone will change just because we're asking them to, I think that's a really tall order and I don't think I'll see it in my lifetime. So I'm not banking on it. I'm actually working ahead of it. Wow, wow. Kit? My salient point uh, leaving this discussion will be uh, civic engagement. We need to be engaged. You know, rather than knocking on the door, you know, begging to come in, we need to be on the inside with the key to open the door and let us in. You know, we need to be at the decision-making table. We have to be there. Otherwise, the decisions are made without us. And here we go again. We're banging on the door and making noise. One of the things that we need to do as a black community, we need to support the members of people that take that giant leap to enter into politics. We have a number of oh, just brilliant people that have put their hat in the ring and we haven't supported them. And uh, away they go, you know, they do the process and away they go. And, and now we're, we're here making noise again. We have to be engaged. And that means being ready to cast your vote. That means that you have to be eligible. So become eligible. You know, you can find the time to go out and protest and make noise and, and, and be very angry, but you can't find the time to get yourself in the position to be able to vote, to effect real change. That has to stop. We have to do it. There is no more time. That's enough. One of the most important things I heard on the TV, on the radio, on the internet was coming from us. And it simply says, we're tired. We're tired. Now's the time. So Mayor uh, Tori, if you can just give us your final words on systemic racism and the way forward. But I've had a long association, you know, trying to um, work with and be an ally to the community long before I was mayor. And I guess um, there's just a huge amount to be done. It, it sometimes seems like there's been no progress made, but I think, in fact, there has. I just think, though, that, that education, and by education, I don't mean people in the Black community getting more education. I mean educating the rest of the public about the history and about the reality of today. And that's what we're trying to do at the city by acknowledging anti-black, systemic anti-black racism and by trying to come to grips with it. The engagement that was just talked about um, is, is just hugely important. You know, um, it's just one of those things where, and you know, I, I want to, uh, to say to Keith, I mean, what he said about people, in particular running for office, what Michael Thompson said is important because that's gonna help us to produce better results out of government. Um, and then accountability. Uh, accountability and, and I think in the end if you you know uh, people often say uh, I, I, I used to be a progressive conservative I have no party now but they always would say well conservatives always want to measure things well at least, and lots of them do uh, who are in business and so but if you don't measure something in terms of how you're doing you know are, are promotions improving inside the public service are the incidents of um, incarceration of young black people going down the percentage uh, you know there's a whole long we could spend two hours having a list 
And I just think if you have that education, you have that engagement, you have that accountability, I believe we're at a moment in time now where there's an unprecedented consensus, uh, as we've seen in the last few weeks, caused by some terribly tragic events, but I think it's an unprecedented consensus that is going to help us, and by that I mean people who are in positions of public responsibility, to not resolve the problem entirely. I agree with Michael in that regard. That's something that's going to take a long time, as it took a long time for it to get to where it is. But I think we can make more progress than perhaps in any other generation, um, you know, just because there is that consensus and because there's broad agreement among public office holders uh, that uh, the time has come. Uh, you know, the time is long past, actually, but that the time has come when we can do more. This is the first in a series of programs that together, uh, Afro Global Television and the Canadian Black Chamber of Commerce will be rolling out together. So do stay tuned for more information and more really uh, engaging discussion. Wow, what a great program this has been. I'd like to thank you all for joining us from across Canada and for keeping the chat room buzzing. It was such a delight to read all the messages. And I'd like to especially thank our panelists, uh, Mayor John Torrey, Deputy Mayor Michael Thompson, Professor Afua Cooper, and Superintendent Keith Merritt. I'd like to also thank the Canadian Black Chamber of Commerce for partnering with Afro Global Television and the Transformation Institute for Leadership and Innovation to make this event a reality. As I said earlier, this is the first of a series of programs that will be rolling out in the Together for Change campaign. We're going to be having PSAs, documentaries, biographies of people of African descent, and a few town hall meetings. So uh, visit our website to find out more information about this. Now, there's something that Deputy Mayor Thompson said that really touched me. He said that the change that we seek may not happen in his lifetime. And this means that the advocacy work that needs to happen for justice and equality and equity to happen regarding people of African descent is going to be a long one. And this calls for all meaningful people, all people of goodwill, to join hands to make sure that we do not give up until justice is won. This is not a time for us to look away. As it is said, if you raise your hands, you'll be counted. So we as a people, we have to raise our hands. We have to pull together. We have to make sure that we're sitting on the table, our voices are heard, and that change happens. Until next time, I am Patricia Vivian Mawa. Do have a wonderful time. And remember, the change that you seek begins with you. <laughs>